In fact, we'll right. go there for breakfast again. Today. You're looking good. <coughs> yeah. Well, welcome everyone. We are going to be talking about development. I love this topic. Resourcing, <laughs> what we do at our organizations. Um, this, this will be pretty casual today. Uh, after folks introduce themselves, you know, take a few minutes, I'd say like three minutes like on who you are, what your role is at your organization, and um, some of your areas of expertise. And then folks in the room, if you can think about why you came to this room for this session today, like what are your most pressing issues that you would uh, like some insights on, and folks at the tables, uh, I'm sure could provide you with some insight. And then I'm pretty sure that if you came to this, you have probably have some knowledge about development already. Um, and I think that might be a really good concrete way to, to spend our time together. How's that sound? Okay. Deb Vinsel. Let's not start with you, because you have a mystery phone call. You're not that I've never read it. <laughs> 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 All of a sudden, I never did. Never, until this morning. Until this very moment. Okay. All right. So I'm Deb Bensel. I'm the CEO of Thurston Community Media up in Olympia. And I um, uh, have been around this organization and this movement for not as many years as Alan, <laughs> but for like 35 years. So um, we recognized about 20 years ago the need to start to diversify revenue sources and implemented um, not an overly aggressive, but an assertive contract services and earned revenue program, for lack of any other term, um, at our organization. We do some traditional fundraising where we ask folks to write a check and make a donation. Um, but while I was getting ready for this, I was digging through a file <laughs> and found this handout that I handed out at Tampa, Florida in 2004 at the National Conference, which is all about creating a development <laughs> plan for your organization. <laughs> so while I will not go into details on that, you're welcome to that. And I brought some literature about services and uh, media services that we offer to nonprofit organizations at government agencies and also our business circle, which is a way for local businesses to support um, without stepping across that commercial content line. So my focus today is more on raising money through business activities as opposed to through traditional fundraising asking for donations. So that's what I'm doing. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sarah McAtee. I'm the Director of Annual Fund at KNKX885. Um, we serve Western Washington and are based out of Seattle and Tacoma. Uh, I'm actually, I'm soon to be the Associate Director of Development on May 1st, uh, so I'll be taking over the major gifts program at that point. Uh, I started at KNKX as the Data and Gift Processing Manager. Um, and in that position, I was responsible for managing our gift processing team and all of our um, technical tools that we use to gather donations, so online forms, email marketing, all of that. Um, uh, during my time there, I've managed our membership program. Um, I do our uh, on-air pledge drives now. I manage those. And all of our direct mail, telemarketing, and ongoing um, membership efforts throughout the year. <laughs> just, just something. <laughs> 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 <That's all laughs> <too>. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm Becky Myers. I'm the development director at KBOO Community Radio. I've been in my position for three years, um, having come from a very minimal development background, but from more of a marketing background. Um, I've been uh, learning a lot in the past year. I joined RAC's Art of Leadership program and have um, applied for the Cultural Leadership program for the organization. Um, I also am part of WVDO's PSU nonprofit development um, graduate certificate this year, and so I'm wrapping that up with um, uh, an audit of fundraising practices at KBU. Um, I'm also the board president for Freeform Portland, and am working on developing systems for fundraising for them. 
and um, I do a bunch of other stuff too. Um, I'm a generalist, but in the sense that I have an understanding of like individual contributions, memberships, um, underwriting a little bit, but my focus has been grant writing, um, major giving, direct mail, um, legacy giving, um, and strategic planning. And so figuring out like what our efforts need to be throughout a year and um, what kind of uh, preparation we need to do in order to achieve our goals. Um, one of the other things that I focus on is um, collaborative work. And one thing that I'm, I've been really interested in is um, Oregon community media and bringing that together and operationalizing it. But yeah, I have been working pretty heavily with KBU with um, the systems that are outside of membership and underwriting because I work on a team of revenue generators in that way. I brought some stuff today too. Um, I brought an example of what a month by month annual plan might look like and I can explain that. I brought some hot tips. Um, <laughs> One of the things that's really critical about development and building an annual plan is understanding what your funding mix is. Mm -hmm. And so how do you take a look at that critically? Um, I brought some examples and I'm happy to share how to do that with you. Um, and as well, like understanding what your true cost for fundraising is. And so creating a development budget, what your expenses and um, what your staffing needs might be, and then doing the analysis in order to figure out how much it costs you to raise a dollar. Those are all really critical parts of that, what I've been kind of focused on instead of one singular thing, but that's me. Hi, I'm Mike Schur, I'm Director of Finance at Metro East Community Media. Joined a little over a year ago to help transform our outdated accounting finance back office and with the the design to implement um, some newer technologies to help us focus on growth rather than internal operations. Um, my areas of expertise outside of finance, I would say, are strategy development and um, problem solving. So coming up with innovative solutions to things that are either uh, aging problems, new problems, um, that includes operations, uh, workflows, processes, and then I'm part of the leadership team and we have successfully already um, for this fiscal year captured over 200,000 in actual cash dollars of revenue diversification. So that's 10% of our annual budget for this year. And that's not in kind, that's actual bank account. So, was, um, and that's part of the the work that we're doing uh, with our leadership team at Metro East to diversify our revenue outside of our traditional sources of um, cable franchise fees. So I'm happy to talk about what we've done there from production to grants um, and other sponsorship arrangements that we've created to garner um, some, some of this new revenue funding that we've received. Thank you, everyone. I am so excited about your work and that you're able to be here today. <laughs> this, is, this is tremendous, this is a great walk. Um, folks in the crowd, what made you come here today? Did anything <laughs> that they sparked, <laughs> anything uh, seem especially pressing to you? And let's do a little bit of a stack. So we've got one, do we have a two, two, and a three? And a three, okay, go for it. So I work with Mike. Yeah. Metro East, and I'm really interested to see what other organizations are doing. We're very new at the fundraising, kind of grant, grant writing, rethinking how we do things as we move forward. So what's that? Why? Oh, rethinking things as you move forward. I like that. Other person named John. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm John. Um, I'm from Chaos in Olympia. Um, I'm the Maybe, um, and so I would like to, you know, like how? What are my first steps? 
to begin that process. That is super exciting. All right, let's hear from Mike, and then let's then you know address what you guys were all talking about. So you know, I, I work with uh, ACM members across the country. Um, it's the number one, two, and three thing that is brought up, um, and there's a lot of confusion, frankly, about fundraising versus getting money, mm -hmm. right? Big difference. Uh, lack of resources versus resource development, sustainability versus lack of panic, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, I would say, uh, what do folks think about like, like five minutes on first thoughts, initial thoughts on what to say to John um, at Chaos in Olympia um, about, let me see if I'm getting this right. So like, you don't have a budget for development director, you're new in this role, even though you've been in radio for like 12 years, you know things, uh, and then how to make the most out of a situation where you have relationships with major donors and the station certainly has relationships with major donors. How do you just start in on that in an intentional way? Yeah, like or, we, we have a background in you know, underwriting and uh, fund drives. Like, you know, that part is, you know, that's part of the you know, DNA and history of the station. But the, the major giving piece um, isn't an aspect of it, um, and then especially in the financial time. Okay, and just for folks in the room who might not know John's station, Chaos, K-A-O-S, in Olympia, Washington, it's at the Evergreen State College, it's a campus community radio station, and it's 40 years old? Uh, 45. 45, and it's been at the cultural epicenter of a lot of, a lot of things, locally and in the country. Yeah. Um, a station not unlike Becky. Well, there is one critical difference in that your license is owned by Evergreen mm -hmm. and that Evergreen, if, I remember talking to Ruth about this because she had frustration about their operational needs and like how much money was coming in and the university has policies where you have kind of limited activities in your own fundraising outside of what the university is expecting you to do. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I think it starts with a conversation with your administrators. I think like finding out exactly where you have the room to do something is, I think, like your primary challenge. You may have more like latitude in some places and less in others. And I think major gifts is probably going to be one of those places where you don't have a lot of room because the university has its own advancement department that will very much be focused on that. The other thing that I would say is major gifts for, I mean, like everything's cyclical, right? And so what we're finding in the development world is that's sort of like the catch, like the, the hot topic, right? So like, oh, major gifts. Like we saw the Phil Knight challenge. That was amazing. Like everyone, major gifts are, they solve everything literally. And, and actually they can harm your fundraising because you're leeching off of who might be giving to your annual fund or might be giving in other ways. And especially if what you're doing, because restricting it and having a really compelling, like, hey, here's the project we're bringing you kind of thing, can it, it can create a, an instance where you don't have the money for your operational needs, instead it's for something restricted. So that's, that's just sort of what's happening and how I understand chaos to operate. We, we're a um, community licensee, so you know, whatever our community is okay with us doing, we can do, but, but there are limitations within that too because we're not necessarily knocking down doors to get Exxon money or whatever. So mm -hmm. that's the difference. Um, Deb has something she wants yeah, to say real um, quick, and then Sarah, I've got a question for you. I would imagine you've already had a conversation with folks at the foundation. 
so because when they go out for major gift planning, there might be a place with the Evergreen Foundation to include chaos as one of the buckets that people can give to, because that's where all the money gets processed through anyway. Um, I also sit on the board of directors of the Washington Center for the Performing Arts, and we're in the early, kind of like the soft launch of a major capital campaign, um, and are looking for major gifts for that, and of course every board member has been asked to make a gift toward the capital campaign, and you know, I, we, I'm comfortable, but I don't have huge resources, mm -hmm. and one of the things that, to key on what you said about leeching off of other potential donors, is our executive director in making a request of board members for a specific dollar amount. And I said, well, I can do that, but I can't do this too. And she goes, yeah, we don't want to strangle the goose. We don't want to strangle the goose that lays the golden eggs. So you do have to be careful when you're looking for those major gifts. If you approach somebody and say, could you give you know, $2,000 this year for whatever? And they say, well, yeah, but then I'll have to discontinue my sustaining $200 a month. You know, so you know there's a balance there. But you have to be careful. So I, I would really say maybe sitting down with the with the major gift officers at the foundation and seeing how how they might be more aware of your needs and how they they're because they're doing it. Yeah. And see if they can you can build they build into that. That's an awesome resource. So, so we're at yeah. the three minute mark on mm -hmm. John's um, issue, and I want to know, John, with your pledge drives, uh, when you get a donor comes into the pledge drive. Where does the database live that their information goes into? Is it with chaos or is it with institutional advancement at the college? It is both. Um, it gets processed um, by um, the development you know, in their office. Uh, you know, they process all the um, credit card info and all that, and, um, and they actually print out um, the form, the tax forms and stuff, and send it to me to sign and all that. And, and we also maintain a, you know, a database with our donors. Okay, so enter Sarah with her fascinating case history with um, so the transition, <laughs> if you will, yeah, exactly. from KPLU mm -hmm. to KNKX and their database for Yes. Well, I guess I should give some background about that if people don't I think know it's instructional. It in uh, so in, um, up until August of 2016, our station was owned by Pacific Lutheran University. Um, we started in the 1960s and we're just approaching our 50th anniversary uh, when the university announced they wanted to sell our station to um, the University of Washington, KOW, and they essentially dissolve our services and we would all lose our jobs. Um, and the community came forward and uh, we had a giant grassroots campaign to raise $7 million in six months um, to purchase our, the license ourselves and have a community license. Um, and we succeeded, uh, but when it came to separating from the university, um, it was a bit complicated when it came down to our database. Uh, we were lucky, I think this is, might be a little different from what your setup is, but uh, we maintained a separate donor database from the university. Um, all of our credit card payments, anything online, checks, um, all of that were processed by our own staff. And so uh, unless the university requested the information, they didn't have it um, about our donors. So we had a lot of autonomy for how we could communicate with them and fundraise. Um, there also wasn't a lot of overlap between their donors and our donors, so it didn't really matter if we were fundraising um, to separately. Uh, so my first question to you would be, how much overlap do, is there, or do you know, between your chaos donors and university donors? I'm not sure. I mean, I would re research that um, and see if it would make a difference to if, to try and um, get some autonomy from the university. Um, and I would also ask how they're using that information. Um, are they are they sending are they sending a deal? Do you know? I should tell you. How do they? Yeah, I, I get yeah. Um, I get the uh, tax receipt comes from 
from the foundation with the chaos signature, but it is from the Evergreen Foundation. And yeah, I get appeals from the foundation three or four a year. About the college. Uh, for the college. Not the radio yeah. station. Yeah, yeah. yeah. not okay. chaos for to support Evergreen. Yeah. 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 That's so, interesting. So as you develop your own strategy for developing your major giving program and your plan giving program, when you're looking at bequests, you have to get very clear and very legal about where that money goes. Mm -hmm. Should chaos dissolve, and that donor will probably want it to go to something that's aligned with the chaos mission, not necessarily Evergreen's educational mm -hmm. mission that might go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So one more thing from Sarah on this, mm -hmm. and then another question from the room, maybe. Um, so if I would, I would research those things, and then um, maybe I, I don't know um, if the resources are available, but maybe do a well screen on your own data mm -hmm. and identify people that might be potential major donors, and um, and then go to the university with those people, specific people, and with a plan, and see if they would work with you on it. Yeah, building a relationship with your yeah. like foundation mm -hmm. folks sounds like something you have to do. Because they may also have the wealth screening capacities, and it just means being friends with them and asking for that help. I would try to get as much autonomy as you can. Yeah. Politely. Yes. Politely Graciously. get autonomy, get all the stuff you yeah. want. And yeah. <laughs> run it by lawyers and have everything yeah. written down. And perhaps some of the sugar in my views is, you know, when they're getting ready to do a campaign, invite them to come be on the air. To, yeah, you, you know, to encourage alum in the area to support what's going on, so you can help them to market what they're trying to do and be a benefit to them, not just somebody who's asking to be included. You know, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anyone else who's in perhaps an entirely different kind of situation? Well, well yes, Matthew. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm different. I mean, I've done development in other places. Where we are now, where the organization has never really done any kind of diversified funding outside of franchise fees, um, although it's been their strategic plan for 10 years <coughs> to do so. Um, yeah. Right. So I, I guess, you know, and, and I know something for me and things I go through, what would be the key lessons you've learned that you would tell people as you start or work in on development programs or diversifying funding? You know, what have you learned that you would say? I had to do this over again, I wouldn't approach it that way, or this is a key thing you really need to think about. I can talk about the grant success that we've had. So Metro East didn't really have grants outside of the, the cable franchise grant that we had. And in uh, February of 2006, 17, we actually operationalized a new facility in an economically um, diverse zip code in, in Gresham, Portland called Rockwood. It's an educational lab with the mission of teaching youth and um, underrepresented populations, giving them access to digital technology. And um, it's also an area that has, it's kind of a, a bandwidth desert, so there's not a lot of internet activity going on there. So access to resources is very low and the internet does not necessarily exist in the same way that it does in other parts of the geography here in the greater Portland area. And so we now have had significant success in the grants and grant writing. We actually recently received, we found a, a, a couple that, can, that is interested in the work that we're doing. I don't know how, it just word of mouth, written relationships, and they've written um, their contributions, but their project grants. So the benefit is that we, didn't ha we don't have reporting requirements to them and we didn't have to um, go through the same rigorous process as we have with some of the other grant submissions. So that's kind of a contribution in the form of a, a project grant dedicated to Rockwood. And then we actually have had success with smaller grants, um, specifically for Rockwood from the city, from uh, diversity relationship funds that, that are focused on diversity, inclusion, science, technology, education, and uh, most recently, some of the larger foundations in Oregon. And so um, that, what, so articulating our story to the large foundations is key. So being very specific about 
what we're doing and the outcomes that are happening and connecting because the, the work that Metro East does as a whole organization versus the work that we're doing are at Rockwood, while education is the underlying foundation, um, it, it's kind of, um, I guess it's, it's bifurcated. The, 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 the foundations are really interested in the work we're doing in Rockwood and not as interested in, in historically kind of the, the community media mission that Metro East has been serving. But Rockwood really appeals to them because this is um, a group of people that, that are not having access to digital technology resources. So for us, it was coming up with a story that resonated, right? It's just very meaningful and that people would get it immediately. And when we, when we started to, uh, I see your hand, Mike. When we started to get to that, um, some of the organizations wanted to come and experience it and ask us questions. And they actually asked us to hold off our submission so they could learn more about the work that, that we're doing there because it was still coalescing and, and growing. And so I, the biggest thing I would say is having a, 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 like a straightforward way of describing the work that you're doing that easily resonates, that captures people's hearts um, without all of the mission statements and the value statements, simple English words that like, this is how we're helping people by giving them you know, access to digital technology and tools that they are not able to find elsewhere. And the outcomes are, you know, it's, um, it's training, it's um, potential job diversification skills, um, it's, you know, giving, it's creating in inclusion and kind of balancing the, the divide, the digital divide that, that, that we see with people who have privilege versus those that don't have the same access to the privilege resources. So um, I noticed that when we started to tighten up our story, and it became very, very clear about what we're doing there, and it's, it's getting better. And so that's what we're focused on is, as the story gets better, the dollars are starting to follow it because now the classes are growing and the awareness is growing, and so we're continuing to invest in that area because we've experienced success with it. Is it Mike and then? Yes. Yeah. Matt. Really short, uh, I'm really glad you talked about how Good, very often that's something that we can't talk, we don't talk about when we talk about the community mm -hmm. um, So try to find a way to actually talk about the way you actually make a difference and that an investment makes a difference in someone's life. It's extremely part of that, that storytelling you're talking about. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say is about the things that you're talking about is that you weren't backfilling operations that are currently existing. And funders do not want that. Simply do not want that. So that's a huge challenge for an organization that already has an operational burden. So the, 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 there's, a, there's a leadership issue there that goes beyond develop, goes beyond raising money. It's like sort of like where are you going as an organization? Yeah, right. and we're actually because we've experienced success. The, the, there's been a recommendation to reconfigure resources and allocate more resources to this area, which still serves the mission from an education standpoint, from a digital technology standpoint, access to uh, equipment training. And so to focus, to kind of shift internally what we've done for the past 15, 20 years and give some more life to uh, a growing situation that, that, we, that we see is, is, has a lot of potential with minimal resources having been granted to it. So we've done a lot with very little for this. And so I think if we do more, if we give more resources to it, then we'll see a larger output and uh, bigger outcomes. And we're documenting everything. We're making videos, telling stories. So we can actually, at the end of the day, is if we can show like one of the films that we made, which isn't related to, it's related to Rockwood, um, it is a, uh, one, so it was a film by youth, uh, kid, they're teenagers and they, we paired them up with uh, producers, directors, and they made a movie about um, incarceration. And it won uh, at the White House, South by S South Lawn, and they got invited there. So like documenting that and having examples, specific examples of media projects like that. There's media, uh, music video camps, um, music video, uh, how, to, how to make your own music video, how to make a song, how to make a podcast. So we have different products that, are, that haven't been historically part of our curriculum and that are relevant to the times today that 
um, are meaningful to people, especially younger younger folks who are interested in these types of things. Could I dovetail on that before the question? Yeah, I think it's really question. Okay. <laughs> well, one, one thing that I think that Mike was getting at what you're talking about is having a really strong like understanding of where you're coming from and so having organizational documents that help you walk through the design of a program of your ask and what is the overall theory of change that you as an organization are going to be like bringing into the world what does a logic model look like in terms of what you're doing are you like it, there are a lot of like foundational sort of preparations that you have to do if you were going to be seeking foundation funding and then building relationships which is a soft skill and takes outside time like meeting with program officers and having a human connection with them so like but doing all of that like background work making sure you're talking in like a really distilled value like added way about what you're providing the community what you're changing is that you're affecting is an important step in the process. Um, on an organizational internal side, um, in addition to a really great story, I think it's really important to get staff buy-in yeah. as well. Um, at just planning pledge drives, I work with every single person on staff in pretty much every department. And so um, I really need everyone to recognize that uh, fundraising is important for our organization, and I hear a lot um, of nonprofits um, encounter or development professionals encounter barriers with management or the board um, when it comes to fundraising through certain channels. So, um, educating your staff as well as, as your uh, audience, I would say, is important. Super critical, absolutely. Do you have anything to say, Deb? about this particular conversation. No. <laughs> I have plenty to say. <laughs> in, in general, or do you, do you want to go well, do a new direction? No, you know, well, in general, I would say, um, Google. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, you know, making sure you've got buy-in on board and staff is so critical. Um, that's a struggle we've had because, in, in, quite frankly, truth be told, one of the reasons that I tend to focus more on the contract service fee for service model is I have a board of directors who is resistant to fundraising. They're fine with saying, oh, so and so at such and such an organization needs a video for their donor lunch mm -hmm. and they, they've got money to pay for it. But, you know, so, um, so we, we struggle too. I mean, I think in many ways, as long as we've been trying to generate a, a really vibrant development program, we're still you know, 15, 20 years down the road, still struggling to find how that works for us. But contract services have been good for us. And um, more about that later. <laughs> well, that's, that's such a huge yeah. educational opportunity. Yeah. Fundraising is totally different from soliciting, mm -hmm. right? And that, that distinction needs to be outlined mm -hmm. with like big highlighter letters or whatever <laughs> on this hot tip sheet. I just want to say, I put um, kind of the breakdown of what fundraising is. And I would say maybe even 5% of it is making the ask. 40% mm -hmm. of it being the cultivation of relationships. 40% of it beyond that with the thanking and the, the communication of your impact. And then the remainder in identifying your opportunities and how, like, you're going to be talking to somebody who may be already within your fold. And how do you convert them to, you know, like a, a greater step of giving? So that, that education piece is critical because your board, for example, doesn't necessarily have to hit the pavement to ask for money. They could be sending out thank you cards. They could be, you know, like building relationships and having their advocacy be a part of that cultivation process, which is a hugely critical part of the process. So the, that education and also building a culture of philanthropy within your organization, because a lot that, that's the other part of the educational process. It is critical for us to have the resources to serve our missions, right? But part of that is coming from a place of like, a, of, 
understanding that we can do it, that, you know, it's not that we come from scarcity, that we have to climb over everybody and figure out like how we grab every single scrap. We are worthy organizations doing important work. And so coming from that viewpoint and framework is a culture shift that takes a lot of work because we either have come from a place where we get money to do our work or we come from a place where we are absolutely guilty about our relationship with money. How do you break both of those kind of toxic scenarios in order to be more effective fundraisers? That's your work for years. <laughs> Just TLDR, I hope you're ready for it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyone else in the room have, have a thing that was pressing on them, like why they came to this today? Okay, yeah. <laughs> I just want to jump in from the board, from, I'm going to put a board hat, my board member's hat on, uh, from the Washington Center. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think that, um, A, obviously, you need your board to buy in and contribute, period. Um, I find it very challenging as a board member of the Washington Center to ask other, I don't do direct ask very often because there's a bit of a conflict there, but when I ask folks to help support the Washington Center, you know, I want to know that my fellow board members are also contributors to the Washington Center, and you've all heard that before, and it, it bears, it's true. 80% um, of donations come from individuals. So when your, board, when your board of directors goes, can't you just write a grant? <laughs> you know, well, you know, write 10, get one, maybe. So. 80% of philanthropy is from individual gifts. Um, so I think that's important to, you know, kind of just hold that up and go, oh, we all have a network of people. So when I'm approaching folks to give to the things that I find um, important to me, I recognize that a lot of people are going to give because I ask them not necessarily because the thing I'm asking them to support is their passion, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, my entire family gave money um, to Thurston Community Media because I was celebrating my 25th anniversary with the organization, and so, you know, my entire family lives in Ohio, <laughs> you know, so, but they gave because I asked them, and good friends gave. So I think that's the difference when you're doing individual donations versus like business or philanthropy. You're asking people to invest in something that you have a passion in and nine times out of ten they're going to invest because it's you making the ask. It's the relationship you have with them. That's, my, that's been my experience. I would also um, go on to say that there's a critical structural difference between annual fund and individual giving mm -hmm. overall and a capital campaign. Capital campaigns are limited duration and for a specific purpose. So whether or not that's, you know, the like capital outlay for building or if it's for like building your endowment or whatever happens to be the case. I mean, it's also critical to know that when you engage in a capital campaign, it is an intense process and without the right capacity, you will not be able to do it. If say, you haven't run the feasibility study to find out if you have the staffing and so you, what are the things you need to do? Well, you have to figure out if it's possible and if it makes sense to do it. What beyond what your budget is, you know, to do the thing you want to do, do you have the necessary staff? And if barring that, do you have the resources to hire the necessary staff to do it? On top of that, then understanding that um, that limited run make it can make it a little difficult to like make sure that you get the funding you need for your organizational needs. Also, there are ways to quantify your results in a capital campaign that may not necessarily be cash in door, right? Could be in-kind donations of services and goods. It could be how you were trying to get your major donors engaged with it and so say getting people to make the quests 
that serve the function of this particular capital campaign mm -hmm. and counting that as unrealized perhaps, but money in the door for what your effort is. That's what they did in the night challenge. Most of the money that came from that was bequests. They only, I think out of, so it was a $1 billion challenge or something? No, 1 million, something like that. And I would say Phil Knight was going to match half of it, 500,000, something along those lines. I am fuzzy on the numbers exactly. Um, but only $182,000 came in the door for that campaign. A lot of what they clocked towards the success of that was people making requests that would be specifically earmarked for that campaign. Are you looking at doing a capital campaign? Me personally? <laughs> oh, <God>, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but we have She's organizations who are interested in, in um, you know, in developing that. And you said feasibility study. Well, that's what I was going to say. So can you talk a little bit about that? Well, that that is a, a huge, big old process. So it involves like taking a look at your organizational health and what risks and liabilities you have, what your staffing currently is, how long. Are you willing to engage in fundraising in order to do the thing? Is it, are you able to do the thing if you don't raise all your money? What is your like strategy and what donor base do you have for that? Because I mean, a lot of like major gifts are gonna come from relationships you already have, but you are cultivating in a way that gives you the gifts that you need to do the thing. That's a short, Thing. Yeah, because you also have to figure out like you know what are like specific pitfalls. I mean, like there's a whole analytical design aspect to it that you have to go through in feasibility studies, just an umbrella term, as to like you know. Well, depending on the, the chunk of money you need to raise. Yeah. Um, that there's that relationship between like size of chunk of money and then extensive detail. Mm -hmm. um, because I would also recommend working with someone who has experience with feasibility studies yeah. and doing the component that is lots of interviews yep. with um, folks who are like the historic um, supporters of these kinds of things mm -hmm. in, that, in that community. And then I would also encourage incorporating newer philanthropic ideas, um, you know, components that are social giving um, and then more democratized components. Um, because I think for our community-based projects, it's really great if you, you can have do to something have community with the historic too. donors of large chunks of money and then a, a way to, um, to, to work with those $25 donations. Mm -hmm. So there's a component there. Um, um, you you <laughs> recently did, did one. Yeah, it was kind of unorthodox, uh, but we are um, we are about to launch another capital campaign this summer. Um, kind of, uh, we don't really have a choice. We have to move out of the building that we're in. Uh, so um, the, our major gifts team and our director of development has been doing a lot of groundwork to get ready for that, um, and has hired a. I think it's Campbell and Company mm -hmm. um, to help with the feasibility, uh, building a gift ladder, and developing a plan um, to get us going. And our major gift uh, officers have been doing meeting with all of their contacts, major donors, and just warming them up to the. Mm -hmm. Never um, spring this on a major yeah, donor. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we don't have all the details yet, but, you know, you can gauge interest mm -hmm. in that way. Um, so they've been working really hard on that and determining, creating a, a gift ladder um, to determine how many gifts of this amount you need and how many gifts of this amount you need, you need to reach your, your goal. Is the gift um, ladder the same thing as the gift pyramid? Um, yes, it's yeah. very similar. Yes. <laughs> all the right so here, it's like, you know what the gift ladder is? Yeah. For a capital campaign? Who wants to break it down? Oh, you. <laughs>
Well, it's, it's for everybody. <laughs> it can, it can, I, 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 when I make my development, um, my budget for the year, I have an accompanying gift ladder to understand like what my work needs to be in order to raise major gifts. But essentially, it's um, the structure by which you are um, you're putting together. Like, how much do you have to raise? Knowing that eighty percent of it is probably going to come from twenty percent of the people that you ask, and that you are probably going to have to ask more people than you expect, and anticipating that they'll say no or maybe later. But I mean, having a lead gift of, I mean, like there there are all sorts of terminologies, but it's essentially having one or two really big gifts and then accompanying smaller gifts, but with lo like a larger number of people that you ask. There's a lot more of like complication and terminology between like lead gift and principal gift and all of this stuff, but um, it, you know, it's essentially just seeing how much you can ask and how many people you have to ask in order to meet your goal, and having a diminishing amount of people asking for or for you asking for larger gifts. Both of you have used terminology that I think many of us recognize what the terminology is, but have no direct experience with it, and that is our development staff and major gift officers. Because <laughs> we don't have, I don't have those. Well, I, I, I don't know. either. I'm, right. I'm the development director right. Right. and the major gift officer. And the grant right, writer. Right, and, right. And be right. your general so, manager. Right, right, right. Yeah. right, right, right. <laughs> so to take yeah. a right. little bit of a conversation on how you have this conversation with the folks who do work within your organization and they historically think that they have nothing to do with development work or institutional advancement. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I think that's really important for those conversations uh, are just some baseline, um, there, I think there are different ways you can frame this, but like uh, rules of the road, rules of engagement in this um, conversation, or just like norms. Like this is how we are going to talk about people with needs. Mm -hmm. We're going to be really careful not to talk about them like ATMs. Mm -hmm. We're going to be really careful to be respectful. And we're gonna have some confidentiality because we all hold pieces of information about what other people's resources are. Um, um, I've been in a room where that conversation was not had first. And it just felt so gross. Yeah. It felt horrible. It felt horrible to see my colleagues whom I respected say obnoxious things. It felt horrible to think about people in this way. Like it just was weird. Um, and I see, feel like just like many different community-based situations where we're talking about norms <laughs> Um, for for hard conversations, like say about race or um, about just hard social dynamics, we all should, should have that conversation mm -hmm. with our colleagues about wealth and how we're handling that. Mm -hmm. The flip side of that is also to not to underestimate who's in the room, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because sometimes it's very obvious where the means lie, and sometimes it's not. Oh, yeah. And we had a situation where we were doing a matching grant with our community foundation as we established our endowment, which is not huge, but it's growing. Um, and one of our members who we had always just, I think, identified as being you know, salt of the earth, um, uh, a pastor of a small church, you know, did not have any anticipation that a check would come from them that had more than one, maybe two zeros on it. And she walked into the door, wrote a check for $3,000 to meet our goal. I was at home. Our staff person called and said, Dorothy's here with a check for $3,000. I'm like, we'll give her a receipt. <laughs> <laughs> and the staff person said, with all sincerity, do you think she met 300 And I said, what does the check say? It says 3000 And I said, then Dorothy met 3000 But it was that, you know, we... It, sometimes those those large gifts come from the places you least expect them to come from. So the conversation not only deals with, you know, how do you how do you speak about people with means, but you know, just to recognize that the well might be deeper than you think it is. Yeah. And folks on your staff or people who care about your organization might Volunteers. might know things that that you wouldn't right. expect them to know about relationships you should be growing. Mm -hmm. 
Mike has a question. Does one person have to own the work? <laughs> I can do that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but one thing that does need to happen is that there needs to be a, a point person that I think puts together a strategy and is responsible for educating people. And also, I mean, to you know, the point where you don't know who's in the room and everything, you need to, I think, understand organization-wide a code of ethics, a code, a code of ethics. AFP, the Association for Fundraising Professionals, has a great one. Um, also, sharing strategic information like donor lists, like your uh, reports that might be analytical in nature, wealth screening information, there needs to be a policy where you destroy that stuff when you're done. Or having like a, a list of what you're doing, like I'm pulling this report. It has sensitive biographical information at the bottom of that report should be, this needs to be destroyed when you're done with it, like shared with like only you, like kind of stuff. There's more official language and stuff. But, but anyway, um, but because I work in a volunteer based organization, I, the only way that I'm successful is because I get to work with people who are volunteers as well, but who are invested in learning how to do the fundraising and who are willing to put in the time to do it. And so getting buy-in by giving education, uh, educational opportunities, um, being able to explain things plainly, and having a plan, like a base annual plan and like a prioritization of need <clears throat> guides my work and I can share that with people and then it's more effective rather than being like, all right, everybody, we're gonna like get together, let's, you know, like tell me all your ideas. Mm -hmm. Chill, like, but I guess I'm doing them. Like, I don't know what is coming from where and how much money I'm raising or whether or not it's like an effort that's going to cost the organization more money than it comes in. It's critical to have an analytical standpoint when you're taking a look at your overall plan. And so that's part of it. But I love working with people and I love having the opportunity to work with people who are also passionate <coughs> in the cause that may be volunteers that aren't necessarily just me because they're the best advocates. They do the best job of telling the story of the organization. Do any of you have group exercises that you do with staff or teams that helps to surface what you're looking for? Making a budget. <laughs> That's like the number one, hey, what do you need to do your job? What do we need organizationally to do the thing? And then from there, that identifies priorities along with a strategic, a strategic plan. Like how your budget reflects your strategic plan and it should always be connected. And so once you have that community engagement piece and you plan together, then you have your priorities already delineated for you. And so then it's just a matter of figuring out what your best return on the effort will be. And you can do that through numbers and math. Um, something we do or have done in the past at KNKX is, um, uh, this is more of a brainstorming exercise, but if you're looking for ideas from staff, um, maybe from your programming department, from management, from different stakeholders in your organization, we have a big meeting, everyone sits around a table, and we put all of our ideas on post-it notes, <laughs> and then categorize them um, uh, all together in one place. Um, so it gives, we've done it with events, um, we've done it with pledge drives. Um, so it kind of creates a bunch of ideas for whoever's managing that particular program to work from as they're developing plans. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we've gotten a lot of great ideas from that. Um, another thing my department does at the beginning of every fiscal year is we get together and plan our calendar for the entire year. So uh, fundraising, marketing, and events, um, anyone who might be communicating with uh, our audience um, or asking for donations, um, we put it all in one place so you can see the balance between 
fundraising and engagement um, and make sure that you're not um, having every communication you send be an ask or um, you're not asking enough, which is really helpful and takes away a bit of the guesswork throughout the, the year. We know exactly what we're going to be doing. Yeah, the communication between departments is critical and one of our opportunities for improvement at KBU because I work on that revenue generating team and two members of that team have largely been absent. And so putting together a unified yearly plan has been a challenge, but one that I think with more work probably we would be able to do. But that, that's super critical because your touches can't always be asked. We do a considerable amount of brainstorming at Metro East around different work groups and ideas. So there, there's a new strategic planning effort which we launched several months ago and it, it's, it's moving um, well. Um, and uh, so ideas are coming together, we're surfacing them, we're honing in on, on areas that we think are pragmatic and, and sustainable. And then what we need to do after that is figure out, okay, who, how are we implementing this And once we make a selection versus just having uh, many ideas that there's no action taken on them. And uh, internally for, for other projects, we're also meeting up in teams and groups and surfacing concepts to figure out best ways to move forward so that it's not just in a one individual is um, you know feeling the onus of making the decision and then just so using the work group to power through in a meeting and one example is this is not development work but software norms we've, we've implemented a lot of new software tools and people are confused as to what to use for when and so we created a software norms group assigned roles, explained what what's used for what purpose, what tool was used for what purpose. And um, yeah, so basically that a lot of ideas came out of that from different people. Uh, roles were assigned for future work. And so we have made considerable progress in that in that area and then moving on to the next thing. So to, to Mike's question about div, you know having a single person or a group, like so our leadership team took on Collectively, we don't have a, de a development individual, so the CEO is actually operating as the, you know, maybe 35 percent, 30 percent of his time, 20 percent of his time, in the development capacity. And the leadership team has supported him uh, for specifically grant writing, and we also worked with a consultant. So the consultant had a specific role that he was responsible for, and he brought the information back to the CEO, and the CEO shared it with the leadership team. Collectively, we made decisions, but I do think there needs to be someone at the apex driving that process. You can have delegated tasks to individuals. However, somebody needs to maintain ownership. Otherwise, you run into paralysis by committee with too many people and, and no one actually takes ownership of it. And there does need to be someone at the top who, who has the final say and, okay, we're going we're gonna to move this forward this way rather than what do you know, it, there's input and then there's decision making. And I think it's important to, to have both. Is anyone else in the room thinking about starting a campaign soon? Or just doing anything development related at the organization? Starting from zero. <laughs> Not after this conversation. Are you kidding? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's a lucky place to be. Like, like I mentioned, I'm the board president of KFFP LP here in Portland, and we started from nothing. We've done some crowdfunding. Um, I helped to direct the on-air drive efforts for the past few years, but our needs are outgrowing our capacities for those on-air drives. And so what, does it, what do we need to do in order to build a sustainable underwriting? Or like, how does direct mail figure into our efforts? Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, it, even just having the words annual fund, or like that kind of stuff come up, that would be, I mean, that's my overall work and what I've been hoping to implement on top of the other organizational things that you have to do when you create an organization from scratch. <laughs> But I'm the only person in the room like that, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or we have a panel later for that, so. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, we're actually in that same spot. Hey. Okay. The Lambert Falls Media Center. Mm -hmm. We moved from an IGA to a nonprofit, and so our 
model changed a little bit, and we really don't have, outside of service contracts, any idea how to move forward on any other funding. Mm -hmm. So, do you have any ideas on that? <laughs> Is it, what's an IGA? Uh, Intergovernmental agreement? Intergovernmental? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was between Oregon City and Westland, split up, and then now we're a, a nonprofit. So Fair we're enough. trying to, yeah, figure out what that, mm -hmm. what that's going to look like. What's your annual operating budget? Like, what do you need to make each year? Um, well, right now we're at uh, about 250000 okay. Um It's very small. And we just recently, we switched over in 2012. But we never really did a restructure of our organization, so we kind of kept it running the same mm -hmm. and realized that's not sustainable. Right. <laughs> and so this year we're doing that, but I don't even have any, I don't have a development group. It's me. Yeah. So <laughs> how many folks do you have um, that you come wrong. every day and show up and do something? Um, you, like participants or employees? Yes. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> employees, and then I'd say but We have three uh, full or three, one full time, two part time employees, and participation. It's up and down, very flexible. Mm -hmm. sure. We have a few, you know, regular groups, but um, we're kind of reaching out to schools, mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, other nonprofits. Do you have a hospital in your area? Yeah, yeah, I do. Nonprofit arts groups? Um, yeah, yeah. So, is the name of your town? Is that Willamette? Uh, we live in what's Oregon City. Yeah, Oregon Oregon City. Falls. It's mainly all of Clackamas County. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. You 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 have the opportunities, especially if you're going into schools, mm -hmm. like to get I think a company funding for the that service. Um, I mean it's it's different. I know that I don't work fee for service in my organization at all. So like you know I can mix up the terms a little bit, but you know like your your direct service to like um, the schools and educational mm -hmm. opportunities will have, I think, a it has a it has a expense burden, but it also has a funding opportunity. And so, um, I would maybe take a look at what, um, gosh, um, like every year around this time, like like state and local like grants come open for like that kind of partnership mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, for education and other nonprofits, so I would take a look at that. Um, but but there's probably a lot of other stuff predicated maybe on your like um, your connection with the community and what outreach needs to look like mm -hmm. and how you're telling your story. It could just be refiguring what that story needs to sound like. How many? Can, I'd like to ask how many of you have fee for service um, programs of any kind. That, um, for us, um, our contract services, what we call contract services, and earned revenue includes everything from uh, facilities usage fee to fee-for-service productions, customized training, consulting. Um, I, as the CEO, have done several fairly significant consulting contracts, one of them for the Alliance many years ago, um, and I do it. In my role, I realize a lot of people think I'm crazy that I just hang my shingle out and pocket the money myself, but I don't want to use my vacation to do that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> so you know, so we, we built this kind of fee-for-service program um, that is most assuredly transactional as opposed to, I believe philanthropy should be mission-focused, not a transactional, you know, I'm going to give you money if you give me something. Mm -hmm. So this is a transactional opportunity. And one of the things that struck us was we had organizations and agencies, we're in a state capital, in a state capital, calling us and going, oh, we want to use your blood, you know, and we'd say, well, take the training, check out the equipment, do the program, and they would inevitably say, can't we hire somebody to do this? <laughs> I was like, so we finally said, sure, hire us. <laughs> you know, so we built a rate card and, you know, based on staff hours and whatever. And it has about a 25% margin in it. We didn't want to make a ton of, you know, we didn't want to be crazy with it. But we make all of our contract services available to organization and the agencies that are organizational partners with us. And that costs 100 bucks a year. <laughs> so we'll build that into the contract. Um, so we did that in order to um, not be going toe-to-toe -to -toe 
against the business community. I will not get between a local production house and All Star Ford. They, that's their market. Our market are organizations and agencies that truly, well, organizations especially may not be able to afford a commercial market, a commercial production house. Um, and the kinds of stuff we do is always stuff that's going to end up on the channel. So we, we looped it into being partners with us to create content that's going to end up on our channels in one way, shape, or form. Not necessarily, you know, if we go out and shoot a six-hour workshop, I may not put the six-hour workshop on the channel, but I may put a 20-minute keynote address and say, we got content, <laughs> you know, we can tie it back to that. Um, and we developed it because, first of all, nonprofit doesn't mean poor, and it doesn't mean you can't make money. It means, you know, it doesn't mean you can't do business activities and make money. Um, we have found it to be very effective for us, primarily because a lot of the more traditional fundraising things you know, unfortunately, the First Amendment sometimes isn't the sexiest thing to sell. You know, we're not feeding hungry children or healing sick people or, you know. Um, but organizations and agencies are more than willing to purchase the service, and it generates 100 to 150000 a year for us every year. So there's that. <laughs> No, MBG. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Starting from zero, just trying right. to put some rhyme or reason on this or structure um, the idea generating and those steps that will build into a plan. Mm -hmm. um, there's a very easy exercise you can do with a group of people who are core to the organization. Mm -hmm. This is these three circles. You call them circles, you can call them buckets. You just put some butcher paper up on the wall and you know, in that first one you're doing, who are the people who are hardcore about this organization? Then it's one step up, and it's one step out, and you Three maybe circles. need to engage yeah. these people. And then the third group of people is usually like folks who you think should know who you are and should care yeah. about you, and you'll create a plan for reaching them and building that relationship. Mm -hmm. And then you start with just those three levels that everyone's starting to focus on, it really helps the ideas come out. Um, but that is a situation where you need to talk about uh, the norms and you know how you're going to respect how you talk about people. Because mm -hmm. as they think about who goes to the circles, they'll be talking, they'll be evaluating those folks and the resources. All right, we are at 12:30. What? Thank you, everyone, for coming to this. Please and come up and get celebrated. Yeah. Thank you. All. And come and pick up stuff. Stuff and examples.